tonight we are going to talk about property. Um, Because a lot of people, since property has not been tested on the last couple of our exams, a lot of people think that it is something that is coming up. If any of you know me, you know I don't engage in predictions for the exam. I think it's um, really tricky to do so. Not tricky, but it can be really problematic. My own horror story from when I took the bar is everybody said we weren't going to get pure remedies like everybody, because they had just done it three times in a row. It was pure remedies, pure remedies, pure remedies. Essay number one in the morning was pure remedies. And I freaked out and it was not fun. And I was terrified the rest of the day um, and like cried every day at the bar. So um, I don't like predictions. However, I think it's, you know, it's obviously good to be, to review all of the subjects and property is one. The reason I wanted to do property is because it is kind of a least favorite um, essay. So I wanted to cover it, I wanted to cover property because it is so thoroughly sort of disliked by, I think, pretty much, I don't know, I would say a solid majority. We'll say it's like Beatles to Rolling Stones. People dislike dislike it versus Rolling Stones. So, all right. So we're going to keep this a bit tight tonight, uh, not to keep you all. Oops, that was, hold on one second. Oh, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the scoring for the July 2022 essay portion. Just touch on it. If you came to my other workshops or if you've done a score review with me, um, you know that, you know, we had that's something that we talked about. But I want to talk uh, mostly tonight about how to approach California property essays. So a quick little um, a quick little recap on how bar graders grade. So bar graders spend two to three minutes on each essay. That's it. You guys spend years in school and you spend months studying and they'll give that essay that you are just like furiously, furiously typing away to answer. They give it two to three minutes. Um, so they really don't dig into ma to your material to find out whether you've done it correctly, but they do look for really key words and they look for thorough, thorough analysis. But they don't look twice unless you get a second read. The scores generally drop on the second read. You have to make everything really explicit and clear for them. And this, these, all of this that I'm telling you everything I'm sharing, all of the classes that I teach, et cetera, on the writing. Um, this was developed in conjunction with the former bar grader. Um, so that's where I get my info. Also from presentations I've been to from the NCBE. Um, so it's, it's a big, um, I, I know this from the bar graders themselves, also from colleagues who have gone to calibration sessions. I'm not allowed to go since I own a bar company. Um, so this information like this comes directly from them. I know in one session in particular, at one calibration session, and I can explain what that is, but when the bar graders are getting together to um, to you know start the grading process after you've all turned in your exam answers, the bar graders do all get together and they in a group. So there's you know 15 people that are grading essay one, maybe it's you know 15 people. And they all get together and everybody looks at the same essay. They, they'll get like 10 essays. Everybody looks at the same ones. Well, it, it starts first off by the bar graders being given the fact pattern. So they get the fact pattern. They get eight hours to research it and write an answer. Then they come back and decide what, what the um, fact pattern prompted, um, what issues are in there, what the, you know, what the major issues are, what the minor issues are, where the counter arguments are, all of that. So they get a, they get a period of time to actually write the answer and they have a debate about it. And then they come back and they start grading bar applicant answers um, and they do it as a group. So everybody is given a pile of essays of the same essays. Then they all go through and have a debate as to, you know, what should get a 50 versus a 55 versus 60, 65, et cetera, based on how everybody did. And they do several sessions like that where they'll go through and do these rounds of grading to determine what was necessary to get a particular score. Um, a little bit on just grading itself and the July 2022 grading and, and just how it varies over from bar cycle to bar cycle. So on this July bar administration, you needed to get a 61.325 on each written event. So the five essays and the performance test to get which... Um, which would amount to a score of 430 points approximately. And that would equal a 1393. So that's what you needed to hit a 1390. Remember that it's just the balancing you have to get between your essay or your written and the MBE. You need to get an average of a 1390 to pass. 
So, you know, if you get higher on the essays, lower on the MBE or vice versa, those can balance each other out a little bit. Um, for the last, including July, the last four bar administrations, the raw written score needed to pass has been anywhere from 427 to 440. So this time you needed it for July, you needed a 430, but it could be that you need a 440. So you really want to know how to push your scores, your essays, like what gets you a 50 versus a 55, 60, 65, 70, et cetera. And the bar graders are stingy with giving out anything higher than a 65. They're stingy with 65s too, because a 65 is always passing and you have to get some 65s. So in the tonight, I'm going to talk to you about writing your answer, what would be required in a property essay, in this particular property essay, to get a passing answer, what you might do um, to save some time, what would you need to do to get a 60, a 55, and below that. Um, all right. So that is how bar graders grade and a little bit of a primer on, um, on the scaling and the scoring and, and how the points work and you know reading that score sheet. Um, all right. Oh, and here's here is those those numbers, just in case you didn't get them. So the score needed on each written event to pass 61.325, and the total raw written for July 2022. Oh, that's just say July at the top. It was approximately a 430. Here are some really common errors um, in essays. And this list comes from a presentation from the bar examiners. So, and this is all. You know, when I was, um, you know, working with a bar grader, um, these are all verified. This is stuff that, you know, she said as well. So number one, failing to answer the call of the question is a big, big mistake. That is a big mistake. Um, you want to always make sure that you answer the specific call of the question and you have to answer, answer each question. So, for example, if there are four calls in a fact pattern, you have to answer all four. If you don't, you are not getting higher than a 55. Even if you do everything, everything else really, really beautifully, you still are not going to get higher than a 55 because you didn't complete the essay. Number two is failing to use the specific facts. You have to use the specific facts in the fact pattern. Don't, um, you know, you absolutely don't want to, you can, um, but it is best to always use the specific facts and don't paraphrase is what I was going to say. So <clears throat> three, lack of organization is a major error. And it's not that you get points for organizing because bar graders grade holistically. They're not going through and saying, okay, five points for this, 10 points for this. You know, they do have some sort of like allocation of, you know, major and minor, but it's really a rubric. So um, it's really a rubric. Like for example, um, they'll say, okay, like I was just saying, if there are four calls, you can't get higher than a 55 if you don't answer one of those calls. Um, so you, so it's not that you get points for saying, oh, nice heading here, nice rule here, this is a great paragraph, et cetera. That's not why I stress organization. The organization is there so the bar graders when they're spending two or three minutes just so that they can very clearly and easily see that you address the issues that they were looking for, and that you, um, you know, that you went in depth in the right places, that you used the right facts in the right places, et cetera. So it makes it easier for the bar graders to give you to give you those points and to see the great analysis. The converse of that, though, is of course, if you organize really well and the analysis isn't there, then it makes it easy for them to see that it's not great. So we want to make sure that they can see it and make sure that your analysis is strong, so that um, so that you can get all those points. For spaghetti walling, I see this a lot, particularly, I feel like I see it a lot in PR. Um, I see it just all over the place. So, so spaghetti walling is kind of like just throwing, throwing everything at the um, essay and just sort of seeing what sticks. So like raising and dismissing tons of unnecessary issues. You definitely don't want to do that. It's not, that's a waste of time for you. And all of the fact patterns in every essay that I've looked at, and I've looked at hundreds and hundreds, of past California bar essays, there is one that I can think of that really didn't require an hour to write a really great analysis. And it was actually a property essay, but it was just, is there a total taking or is there a partial taking? It was from like 2008. Um, and that was the only time I've ever seen an essay that I thought didn't really take the full hour. Every other essay 
and every essay that you get on the upcoming bar should take you the full uh, hour. And it should actually be, usually it's pretty stressful. There's really kind of two types of bar essay fact patterns. One is, um, is a racehorse and two is a thinker. And often they're kind of a mix of both. So like con law is what I refer to as a thinker, where you have to really come up with arguments. You have to come up with, um, you know, why is this a, uh, a protected class? Why is it not? And you, sh- you know, so there's that, um, you know, when you have to come up with an example of, you know, an alternative to what Congress could have done to achieve the objective when you're talking about, you know, when it's strict scrutiny, um, you know, you, you it's, it takes you, it takes a little bit more mental energy versus just like fact matching for intentional torts and saying like, okay, this is an assault because, or, you know, there was intent because, et cetera. So the, the fact patterns, like I know every essay that I write, I mean, they take me the full, they definitely still take me the full hour. And I'm like, feel like I'm r- racing through it. Cause I do write a lot of these essay fact patterns. I write my answers often under, or at least I'll start, but I'll do them under time conditions to really see like what was reasonable. Number five is failing to tackle the tough issues. You do need to, you know, whenever there is a counter argument, those are generally tough. And you want to address, I say for every essay, I want you to have two counter arguments and I want them to be the two toughest counter arguments. So those issues where you find yourself stopping and pausing and thinking. Um, Poor writing. This, I keep on here, um, but there's a caveat to it. So one, um, this is only an issue. And I will tell you if I have met with you, I will tell you if it looked like on the bar, your writing needed to improve, even like a lot of foreign attorneys, if that's you. Um, they're often worried about this because English is a second language. Um, or if you're not a great typer, because um, I tell people to generally not spell check. So it poor writing is only an issue if it makes your writing difficult to read. Other than that, it's okay. I mean, I mean, you know, it should be nice, but I don't want you sitting here editing out like the passive voice and making it a beautifully worded essay because that's in editing. And this is not all the, all you are trying to do on the bar is write a decent first draft. That's it. That's like, that's it. So keep that in mind. Keep that in mind. Seven, big, big, big one. This is what we call fact dumping, just restating portions of the fact pattern. And it's just restating portions of the fact pattern. I see people do this all the time where, and I've seen it a lot. So if I've met with you and I'm like, all right, you're just restating facts, you're fact dumping. What you're, what that means is you're just restating facts without explaining the significance and that's it. So it's just, you know, you'll just state a fact and then state a conclusion. So I'll talk about that when we look at this essay tonight. Um, But that's a big, big, big one. So people will often tell me like, oh, I used every single fact. Then I'll look at the essay. I'm like, you stated the facts. The facts are in your in your essay, but they're not actually analyzed. You're just restating them. So that's a big one to watch out for. Basically, every single uh, sentence with a fact in it should have a because clause tied to a tied to buzzwords from the rule from your rule paragraph. Number eight, failing to show your work. That is just like stating a conclusion without explaining your reasoning. So not having a because. Uh, Number nine, failing to set forth assumptions. I'll get into this actually in this essay we're going to look at tonight. Number 10, failing to try even if you have no clue. It's really, that could be really tough. How many of you that took the uh, February 2022, or sorry, the July 2022. um, Let me see. Did you have no idea what to do on the BASA? So no idea or nailed it. Let's see, I wanna see this. Oops. Do a little poll. Oh, it help if I hit publish. <laughs> I can't tell. If- if everybody just said no idea because nobody has hit, oh, somebody said held it, good. I would have had no idea. I mean, I would have had some idea. I would have known what to do in that scenario, but it was so hard. That essay was bonkers. That essay was kind of bonkers with that, especially that first call. So failing to try, even if you have no clue, what do you do if you have no idea? You use the facts. And this is something in my, in the Master in the California Bar essays, for those of you that are already in it, I will go over this. Um, for those of you that aren't in it or thinking about joining it, this is something that I talk about all the time. But, cause I wanna show you essays that are gonna be really tricky and really difficult. 
So even if you have no idea, I want you to actually have an approach and want you to know what to do. Um, I want you to know what to do, have some semblance of like, all right, I know I don't know what this issue is. I know I don't know these rules or I know a little bit of it, but how do you go beyond, like, how do you just not just, you know, say, okay, I'm going to do what I know, you know, I'm going to answer calls two, three, and four and not really try for number one. You're not going to get higher than a 55. And if that's the case, the 55 is if you do a good job with two, three, and four, you know, oftentimes the result in a 50, if you really don't try for call one. So, you know, what you have to do is you have to just use the facts and the fact pattern. So with this essay, with the July 2022 essay four, there was a shareholder agreement and there were five different terms in the shareholder agreement. I talked about this in the July 2022 bar review workshop. Uh, but even if you have no idea, at least go through each term and come up with a rule that deals with those facts. So, you know, there is one about uh, electing directors, about, you know, electing the president. Um, a perpetual shareholder agreement. So when I talk, I talk about that for a lot of the different subjects and I talk about that throughout the course. Uh, but you know, how do you try when you get a weird issue or when you get something that you just have no idea about? So that's a, that's a big one. Doesn't happen a whole lot. The other part of that though, the corollary to that though, is you have to practice that when you're studying. This is why I tell everybody that I want you, maybe at first I'm a little bit lenient, um, but you have to try writing your essays and do it a lot, closed note and timed, every single time. Don't look up rules, because for a few reasons. One, you have to try, know what to, what it feels like. I mean, maybe we already know what it feels like and it's really uncomfortable, so we'd like to avoid it. But I don't want you to get to the bar exam in February. Um, I don't want you to get to the bar exam in February saying, oh my gosh, you know, how do I do this? You know, you have, you do, this is a skill that is practiced and I've done it a lot. I've practiced it a lot. Um, and I know that it gets a lot easier um, if you do actually practice that skill. So the other part of that, why do you have to practice tons, closed note and timed is because it actually really helps reinforce your memory. If you just spend time looking up rules um, and you're not really, really trying, um, then it's, it's just, it's not nearly as good for your memory. Um, there's one other point I was going to make there. It'll come back to me. And number 11 is just, you know, not a big thing. It's, I don't, I rarely, rarely see this, but it's really just failing to be professional. So you do need to be professional. Um, this is a professional exam, obviously. And um, the people grading it are, you know, you have to sort of, I sort of think you want to think of it as like someone that's kind of uptight reading it. Like if you think of your most uptight professor, like think of what that person would think of reading what you write. All right. Let's go on to the next one. So now we're going to actually start talking about writing and pre-writing. And I am going to show you, um, I am going to show you this process through writing um, a property essay. So the very first thing you do, and this is something you should memorize and implement and practice over and over and over. Um, this whole process should take you between 15 and 20 minutes. And for a lot of people, that can be a little bit scary to take 15 or 20 minutes and not just start writing. Uh, and I get that. This is why you have to practice it. So um, this whole process, if you take 15 to 20 minutes, what you are doing is, is you are planning out your whole answer. You are thinking through all of the issues. You are triaging, saying, okay, these are the major issues. Thinking about how you need to allocate your time making sure you're using every fact, like really making sure that when you get to the writing process, you're really like raking in all the points. So I always want you to do this. So one, step one, check the call to question, all right? When you check the call to question, I want you to think, okay, what essay is, or what subject is this testing? What subject or subjects is this testing? Once you do that, then you say, okay, if I'm in property, I'm going to write down my issue checklist for property. And this, that should be done. These first two things should be done in, you know, less than a minute, maybe a minute and a half, maybe two minutes. So you're going to do these two steps, one and two, very quickly. Your issue checklist at the start, let's like right now, it's the start of the bar cycle. Like today for people in my full courses um, was day number one. Um, so you're going to jot down that issue checklist. 
And it's going to take you a little bit longer at first. And you should have an issue checklist. And I, if you're in my Master in the California Bar Essays class, I give you an issue checklist for every single subject. So it's um, that is something that um, that I give you. You can also make one yourself. I'm going to give you one tonight for property. I also have one, if you haven't watched all of, all of my YouTube videos, um, I have a PR um, workshop that I did, gosh, quite a while ago. Um, and that you can watch as well. And I do give the issue checklist for PR as well. So jot down your issue checklist. Your issue checklist is something you should have memorized very, very quickly. And you should be able to jot them down shorthand really fast. Um, and like a, a simple little mnemonic. And I'm going to give you a mnemonic tonight. Um, so jot that down. And that's something throughout the bar cycle. Like every day, you should be jotting down and making sure that you know your issue checklist. And you should be expanding it and contracting it. So, which I, that's something I talk about too. I'll talk about that when we get into the issue checklist for property. It's a really good, your, your issue checklist um, is, is a great tool just to check your memorization. And it's a really quick little activity for you to do. And it's something that you can, you know, expand on and um, really just sort of use as like a 15, 20 minute activity every day. And you can do it in different subjects. And it's a good thing to do to like, once you've written an essay or you've done enough MBEs or you're like, you know, have watched, have gone to class or, you know, anything like that. And you want to just change it up and you want to do a little bit of memorization. It's a really great thing to do. So I'll talk about that when we get to the issue checklist. So one, check the call to question. Two, jot down your subject issue checklist. Three, or I also call it the list A. So I use those terms interchangeably. Three, read the fact pattern. And you're reading it carefully. You're marking it up a bit. Oftentimes you'll read the fact pattern and then read it again. So you might read it and reread it, but you read through the fact pattern and you're identifying the issues. You know, like we're all used to that, right? From law school and, um, or just from practicing. So read the fact pattern, identify what all of the issues are and, and check that um, and write your skeletal outline by looking at your issue checklist and saying, okay, what issues are in here? You know, what issues are in here? If I'm in torts, right? You know, I'm thinking, okay, are there any intentional torts? Yes. Is there negligence? Yes. Um, is there products liability? No. Is there defamation? No. Uh, is there any strict liability? Maybe. Right. So um, strict for abnormally dangerous activities. So you want to check, you want to go through, read the fact pattern, and you want to jot down what you think all of the issues are, and then go through the issue checklist and say, okay, have I missed anything? Because when you have that issue checklist, it's not that an issue checklist isn't like, okay, for every contract that say, I'm going to go through, you know, applicable affirmation terms, you know, breach, et cetera. It's not that. It's not like a list of everything that you need to address every single time. It's a list for you to check that when you issue spotted the fact pattern after step three, it's for you to say and just double check against yourself, did I hit every issue here? Am I thinking too narrowly about this? So that's that's what you have to do. Um, so, and then you write your skeletal outline. This is just your headings and your subheadings. So you jot down your, you write your skeletal outline and you do this in your actual answer. Then you go back through your fact pattern and you go through and you place all of the facts into the skeletal outline. So this is, you know, it can feel a bit cumbersome, but when you do this, then you never have to look back at the fact pattern again. You don't have to look back down at your paper. Then everything is just on your screen in front of you and everything is isolated really nicely so that you can really quickly write through your analysis. So I'll show you what this looks like in a few minutes. Number six, you triage. So there are, right, triage, if you don't know what that means, triage is when you go to a hospital, when you go to an ER, they ask you questions, you do a questionnaire, right? And they decide who they're gonna treat first. You know, and this, I'm not talking about who am I gonna treat first in the bar, but you're making a decision as to which are the more important issues, which are the bigger issues, which need more attention. So we triage and I say, okay, you know, in con law, for example, on essay two in the con law, uh, in the con law essay from the bar in July, it was, there were a ton of issues. Um, but in that one, they didn't ask you about standing. They did ask you about mootness later on. They didn't ask you about ripeness. So in the very beginning, I would have done a really quick standing analysis and I would have spent the majority of my time talking about all the various free speech issues, substantive due process, procedural due process. Um, and that was really it for the first call and then mootness and mootness on the second one. So it's really about 
um, it's really about deciding where you're going to allocate your time and knowing no and not spending too much time on a little issue at the outset i saw a lot of people in that comma essay do a full-on like crazy thorough standing analysis and then not have enough time to do both mootness arguments at the end which are which were pretty straightforward those are pretty straightforward so it's really thinking through and saying okay i do know um you know i know standing really well but are they really looking for that and I know in certain subjects, people want to like always, always include certain issues and standing in calm law is one of them, but you have to know how to strategically do that as well. And there are, there are things like that all throughout the bar. So something to be aware of. So triage, you're gonna decide where, what are my major issues? What are my minor issues? Where am I including my counter arguments? And then once you're done with all that, steps one through six, that should be 15 to 20 minutes. Then you have, uh, 40 to 45 minutes to actually finish writing. And when I say write, you you have already been writing throughout this process because you have been including, you have been organizing, you've spotted the issues, you've added your headings and you've put your facts from the fact pattern into the, under the appropriate heading. And by doing that, um, by doing that, you've actually written like half of your analysis. So this is actually part of your writing, but it should, this following this process, and look, you're going to need a little bit of extra time to start. You might take an extra five minutes or so at the very beginning because, you know, you don't know all your rules as tightly and you're getting used to this process, et cetera. Um, so I understand if you go a little bit over, I don't want you to give yourself that time, but I understand it. Um, but you will get faster at doing it and you will see that actually the writing process goes so much faster and you get a lot more down if you follow this process. So one little thing about this. So these are the seven steps. One thing I encourage people to do is like keep a little notepad next to you when you're writing a practice essay. So you're at your computer and you're doing your essay and it's okay to like stop and pause and say, okay, check the call to question, how long did that take? Or even after step two, how much time had lapsed? And then step three, how much time? After step three, how much time had lapsed? After step four, how much time had lapsed? So in, term, in part of, you know, following this process, it can be really helpful because some people say I can't do it and or I ran out of time. I want to know, I always want to know um, where you ran out of time. What, at what stage did you run out of time? So are you getting through steps one through six and at how much time has lapsed there? And then, um, or, you know, is it taking you too long to put in to write skeletal outline, you know, et cetera. So I want you to think about that and track it same thing with the PT course. I teach, you know, those steps, I go through it. Um, so same, same thing there. You have to keep track of your time, but I would absolutely do that here. So we want to be really strategic because then you can come to class and you can say, all right, I had a really hard time with this essay, you know, after step three, like, you know, what could we have done um, to get better at that? So it's questions like that, like really thinking about this exam and, the, and each essay very strategically. Um, if, and one little note, and then we're going to go on the next slide. Um, if the issue is that when you're going through it, if, if you do an essay and you're just like, I just didn't know what any of the issues were, I couldn't remember any of the rules, do what you can. Just do what you can. Do the issues that you know, but the rules that you do know. And like, and I mean, like, really, really, really trying, right? Not just being like, oh, I'll just look that one up. Because I know I was tempted to do that and did do that um, when I studied. Um, but what I really want you to do is if you have an essay that when you're practicing, you just totally botch it, fine, right? We learn from that. So then what we've done is we said, okay, I don't know how to do personal jurisdiction, or I always forget the rules for personal jurisdiction. So that, that one tells me I need to practice memorizing that. And two, it, so I, I, you know, I have information and then the next day I'm going to redo that essay. So you can redo the same essay and then you will the next day, you're going to force yourself to recall all those rules that you couldn't remember the day before. And it's going to actually really help you memorize those rules. I did that over and over and over. The other thing you can do is if you don't want to write, rewrite the whole essay, like I had a notebook, just a paper that I would just rewrite all the rules that I couldn't remember and like how to organize it. Like what is, you know, what are all of the headings and subheadings and rules for personal jurisdiction? I, that just like didn't stick for me when I was studying. So, all right, doing okay. Y'all still, still alive out there, still paying attention? How could you not, right? 
All right. I let's go on to the next slide. Okay, there. Thank you, Arena. <laughs> All right. So here is our property subject issue checklist. This is just a sample. This is um, a slightly simplified version of the one that I give out in my in the Mastering the Cal Bar Essays class. But there are five ma major issues within property. And I, I did simplify it a little bit here. The first major issue, the first major issue is ownership. The first major issue is ownership. So under ownership, we have issues like adverse possession, sale of real property. So it's like real estate contracts and everything that goes along with that. And then some title issues as well. Use of land is the second big issue. Within that, the, and I put asterisks next to the big, big category. So there are the bar graders love testing mostly on landlord, tenant, use of land, and co-ownership. So under use of land, we have things like easements, covenants, and servitudes. We have nuisance, zoning, and takings. I know that there's some overlap here um, with con law and torts, but you know that's just how property is. Big other big issue that we have is landlord tenant. This is like the big favorite. This is a, the big favorite. They did this. I know that we haven't had property on the last couple of bars. Um, however, um, we yeah we haven't had property on the last couple of bars. But like three bars in a row before that, there was property, and they kind of ran the gamut on all of the issues. So property is um, kind of everything is is like could could really be tested in property but as people know if you've been in my classes before um in the in the california essays class about 10 days before the exam i do a workshop where i go through every single subject and what has been tested most recently to say or i look to say what has not been tested recently within every single subject which makes it a bit more likely to come up um so property subject issue checklist ownership use of land then landlord tenant issues. So here we have tenancies, we have disputes. So, you know, this includes, you know, implied warranty of habitability, covenant of quiet enjoyment, et cetera. You also have like your duties, disputes between like landlord and tenant. So you need to know the duties of each, et cetera. Then we have transfers, assignments, and subleases. So this is, this would be everything under landlord and tenant. And these are just some big major categories that have subcategories within them. Issue four, conveyancing. This does not come up very much when it does come up. Um, when it does come up, and this is, I'm saying conveyancing of like present and future interests and also like the technical rules, like Shelley's rule, really good perpetuities, et cetera, which does not really come up on the essays in California. It does come up on the UBE and it's come up a couple times in the essays within the last five, six years. Um, so conveyancing and then co-ownership. So this is another big one. And we're actually going to see a couple of these um, issues come up in the essay we're going to look at tonight. So co-ownership, so joint tenancy, tenancy in common, tenancy by the entirety, and all of the correlated issues. One thing I want to say about this list and what I was saying about memorization before. So under ownership, you know, adverse possession, what are the elements of adverse possession? You know, what are all of the issues that go with the sale of real property? So, you know, land subcontract, deed, you know, deeds, um, et cetera. Um, you know, the warranties, you know, that go along with the deeds. So all of these in terms of a memorization thing my issue checklist that i would jot down would just be ownership use landlord tenant conveyancing co-ownership and i just use a mnemonic for that so i'm really thinking like big 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 picture but as a memorization technique and to like run through elements and issues etc you could take this and expand it so i sort of think of like clicking on a file like on a computer so you click it and then it shows more and then you click it and it shows more so it sort of expands so if you were to click on this, you know, adverse possession, what's everything that would come out of it? If you were to click on sale of real property, what would come out of it? Title issues, all of that stuff. So it's a really good sort of end of the day activity, or maybe it's a little warm up at the beginning of the day, um, is take the issue checklist and expand it as much as you possibly can um, to really just work on your memorization. It is a myth that you don't need to work on memorizing throughout the entire study period. Like, I think that that is completely false and wrong. What, what you do need to do is you need to practice because when you practice, that's where the memorization truly comes is in the forcing yourself to recall, uh, to recall the issues and to recall the rules. Um, but also I think doing a little bit of memorization every day is really helpful. We're also, um, I don't know if you guys get my newsletter 
Um, if you do, great. Um, if you don't, though, you might want to sign up because like I'm going to have a blog post on memorizing and like how to organize, um, you know, when you're creating a study schedule and I'm going to do something on actually like creating a study schedule as well. Um, you know what, you know, really what to do, how to study like you don't just want to say, OK, I'm going to do torts for a week and or torts, just torts for three days. And then I'm going to just do crim law for three days and then I'm going to just do property. You have to do what's called interleaving, not weaving. I always thought it was weaving with a W at first, but it's interleaving with an L, where you have to generally, like we say, touch several subjects a day, which sounds a little creepy now, but like, I want you to touch a few subjects a day. So like, I might do property and torts today. And then the next day I'm gonna do torts and contracts. And then the next day I'm gonna do contracts and con law. So, or you can do three subjects in a day once you get to it. Um, so you want to do multiple subjects in a day. It helps you go longer um, and it helps you with that memorization. And you can do stuff like this where you have an issue checklist and you work on expanding it and then shrinking it down as well. Um, so just so, like some little study tips there. All right. Are you all ready to dig into an essay? Oh, let's. All right. Can you all see the property essay? No. Yeah. from the February 2005 bar. And all of these files, including the answer sheet, um, the, my answer that I'm gonna walk you all through, and like this, it's broken down step by step. Um, all of that will be available in our free workshop course as well within the next couple of days. So let's see. All right, so first thing we're gonna do, step one is we're gonna check the call of the question. So first, and we see here that there's three calls. There's There are three calls. All right, one, what interest do bill, executor, and lender have in the house? Discuss. So I'm thinking, okay, there's bill, there's executor, which makes me think a little bit of wills and trusts and lender have in the house, but there's also a house, which is real property. Then what claims do executor and bill have against each other? Those claims against each other. So I don't totally know what subject I'm in here. I mean, I know I'm in property, but if you're on the bar, um, if you're on the bar, then um, you know you might not know because it's not going to be labeled property essay. And then three is tenant obligated to pay any or all of the rent for the remaining uh, term of his lease, including the five hundred dollars he withheld. Discuss this third call. And this is this essay is from February two thousand and five. Um, just Lucy, just I saw that you asked that. So is tenant obligated to pay any or all of the rent for the remaining term of his lease, including the five hundred dollars he withheld? Discuss. So first thing I want to do is I want to jot down. I want to jot down my issue checklist. I want to jot down my issue checklist. So. Right, so ownership, use, landlord, tenant, conveyancing, and co ownership. Right, ownership, use, landlord, tenant, conveyancing, co ownership. You might just, you might also just do um, O U L, uh, O U um, L T C and C O. So let me see. All right, good. So now let's read through this fact pattern. So Alice and Bill were cousins and they bought a house. All right, so I see that they are cousins and it's A and B and they bought a house. So the fact that they're cousins means it's not gonna be a tenancy by the entirety, right? Um, it's not gonna be a tenancy by the entirety, so that's good. And they bought a house, all right. Their deed of title provided that they were joint tenants with right of survivorship. So. If you didn't know, if you were on the bar and you didn't know initially what subject you were in, because calls one and two are a little confusing, or they don't tell you exactly what subject you're in, then as soon as you get into this first couple of sentences, you know that you're in property because we see joint tenants with right of survivorship. So their deed of title provides that. So I know pretty clearly here that there that there's a joint tenancy. I know pretty clearly that there's a joint tenancy. Ten years ago, when Alice moved to a distant state, she and Bill agreed that he would occupy the house. So I'm thinking, okay, there's Alice moved away. They're joint. They are joint owners. Uh, they're joint tenants, rather. They both have the right to um, 
to possess the whole, they both have a right to use the whole space, et cetera. But Alice moved, right? The fact that she moved um, and they agreed that Bill would occupy the house doesn't mean that Bill has to pay Alice rent, right? He's allowed to use it, doesn't have to pay her rent. In the intervening years, Bill paid nothing to Alice for doing so, but, pay, but he paid all house-related bills, including costs of repairs and taxes. So their co-tenants, all the issues of who's responsible for repairs, who's responsible for taxes, all of that stuff. Generally, a um, co-tenants are all res they're responsible for the bills, but you don't have to uh, reimburse one another, even if it's for like repairs that are necessary. Um, but they are you do have to pay your own taxes. So co-tenants have to pay their own taxes. So there's going to be and so there was executor. I think somebody's probably going to die. These fact patterns are pretty predictable, not to be grim. Um, but uh, yeah, so um, if that's the case, then I'm going to want to you know, know because I see executor in the fact pattern from the calls. So I know that something is going to happen and the executor is going to be, you know, maybe bringing an action or somebody is going to be suing to recover from an estate for um, uh, for some of these expenses. So the bills and taxes. All right, two years ago, without Alice's knowledge or permission, Bill borrowed $10,000 from Lender and gave Lender a mortgage on the house as security for the loan. So right there is something that might potentially, that might potentially sever um, the joint tenancy. So it could sever the joint tenancy and make it a tenancy in common. It depends though, if it's in more, if the, um, the jurisdiction is a lien theory or a title theory state. So remember on the bar that you have to include, you generally have to apply the majority, but on something like this, where there's lean theory, title theory, where there's a minority, instead of doing a, a counter argument there, you're going to address the alternatives. That's the other thing that you do. So wherever there is an alternative, where there's a majority minority, that's going to be a bigger issue that's going to be important. All right. Next, there is a small apartment in the basement of the house. Last year, Bill rented, and as soon as I see that, I'm like, okay, so I know there's going to be a rental, and that's what it tells us. Last year, Bill rented the apartment for $500 per month to tenant for one year under a valid written lease. So you don't need to go through and talk about it, you know, is the lease valid, if does it satisfy the statute of frauds, anything like that. Um, maybe, you know, like in a score, an essay that got 100, they might talk about that, but to get a 65, you absolutely don't have to talk about that. Um, tenant paid bill rent over the next seven months. So there's a one year lease, but they pay they pay rent for seven. So there's going to be an issue. During that time, tenant repeatedly complained to Bill about the malfunctioning of the toilet and drain, but Bill did nothing. So Bill did nothing. So there's uh, implied warranty of habitability, covenant of quiet enjoyment. Um, it's definitely more of an implied warranty of habitability because it's a toilet and a drain and we need proper plumbing to have a habitable space. Um, but, and the tenant notified the landlord bill, but bill did nothing. So is there a breach? Yes. Did you provide notice? Yes. Did you provide opportunity to repair? Yes, because it's over seven months. So these are going to be, this is implied warranty of habitability, covenant of quiet enjoyment. Those are going to be major issues. Tenant finally withheld $500 to cover the cost of plumbers he hired. So what are your opportunities or what are your remedies rather when there is a breach of the implied warranty of habitability? You can, uh, you can repair and deduct. You can, um, you can sue to get them to cover it. Um, or you can uh, leave. You can move out. Do nothing and move out. So the plumbers were not able to make the repair. Tenant then moved out. Bill ceased making payments to lender. Last month, Alice died and her estate is represented by executor. So now Alice died and Bill and lender wants their money, right? So a lot, a lot of issues here, a lot of issues here. So, so here um, I wanna go and I wanna list all of the issues that I've spotted. And you would be, you know, on the actual bar and in the essay course, I do often, I have an iPad and I will mark this up to show you what it would look like for me if I was actually writing this um, on the exam. So, but I have, it's like one of those cooking shows, like on the Today Show. Um, I would go through and um, jot down all of the issues that I have here. And I actually modified it a little bit. So what interest do Bill, Executor, and Lender have in the house? So first, I'm gonna talk about the fact that there was a joint tenancy. 
then there is a potential severance of the joint tenancy. But because there's a severance of a joint tenancy with a mortgage, I'm gonna talk about is lien theory versus title theory. Then what claims do executor and bill have against each other? So rent, and then rent for two different issues, for bill living in the house alone and also for the tenant. And then, um, and then claims for the repairs um, and for the taxes. So here, these are claims that um, that executor would make against bill, the first two for rent, or the first one with the two issues for rent, and then repairs and taxes, that would be for bill against executor for reimbursement. And then we have, is tenant obligated to pay any or all of the rent for the remaining term of his lease, including the $500 withheld? Um, so we have here duty to pay rent. We always start with talking about the landlord tenant duties, implied warranty of habitability, covenant of quiet enjoyment. So these are so first, so the next thing I do, and I've gone through and I've looked at my and I want to go or I want to go back and say, okay, are there any other ownership issues, use issues, landlord tenants? It's really landlord tenants and co-ownership issues in this one. Um, in a lot in property, it's a little bit less that you will see an additional something from your issue checklist. But in torts, it happens all the time. In evidence, it happens all the time. In crim law, criminal procedure, it happens all the time. Well, maybe not crim pro, but definitely crim. But this happens all the time. In con law, it happens quite a lot um, too. So you want to go back, double check that. Next thing we're going to do next thing we're going to do is we're going to go through and we're going to put in all of the facts from the fact pattern all right so joint tenancy and you just copy them over you just copy them over so after step five put your facts into your skeletal outline so under joint tenancy i just copy over alice and bill bought a house and their deed of title provided that they were joint tenants with right of survivorship okay severance of a joint tenancy and i'm actually going to delete this and you can actually, I'm going to delete this. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Two, so lean theory versus title theory. And you could use the same facts here. So the fact, was it severed? Was the joint tenancy severed? So here I have two years ago, um, without Alice's knowledge or permission, Bill borrowed $10,000 from lender and gave lender a mortgage on the house as security for a loan. Okay. And then the same facts here, lien theory, title theory, we're going to use the same exact facts here and talking about what would happen, lien theory versus title theory. All right. And then we have what claims do executor and Bill have against each other? Here, Bill living in the house alone. 10 years ago, Alice moved to a distant state and Alice and Bill agreed Bill would occupy the house. In the intervening years, Bill paid nothing to Alice for doing so. And then tenant. I put the facts here. So just the facts regarding the rent. There is a, and, and the payment of rent. There was a small apartment in the basement of the house. Last year, a bill rented the apartment for $500 per month. The tenant went for one year under a valid written lease. Tenant paid bill rent over the next seven months. And then house repairs. While bill lived in the house alone, bill paid all house related bills, including the cost of repairs. While bill lived in the house alone, bill paid all house related bills, including taxes. So I sort of divided this sentence up from the fact pattern into two here, into two here. Okay, and then the third call, and I'm gonna go back through these facts and show you all something in a minute. Third call, is tenant obliged to pay, obligated, let's just say obligated. Obligated to pay any or all of the rent for the remaining term of his lease, including the $500 he withheld. So I have here, it's really the same facts in here for both of these issues. And we're going to use them throughout. We're going to use them in both analyses. All right. So I have here, tenant paid bill rent for seven months. During that time, tenant repeatedly complained to bill about the malfunctioning of the toilet and drain, but bill did nothing. Tenant finally withheld $500 to cover the cost of the plumbers he hired. The plumbers were not able to make the repair and the tenant moved out. And then same facts for covenant of quiet enjoyment. I'm gonna pause really quickly and just check. To okay, now I'm gonna do something. And this, I think if everybody did this, if everybody just did this at this stage, you would pick up more points. And I talk about this every time in the essay course, I go through this all the time. Um, and I'm gonna hit it even more this time because I see people not doing it. Cause I've done, I don't know, I've met with like 200 people in the last couple of weeks. 
going over their bar essays, looking at all of them. And I can see when I see 55, like you're missing issues. You're not using all the facts. If you got, if you got a 55, if you got a 60, if you got a 60, there are littler facts that you're not using or that you're not explaining. So what I want to do is I'm going to go back through here and I'm going to show you all some stuff. Like, how do you figure out if you're missing something? And this is it. So you, I turn on my little highlighter. If you're in the bar, you just get your actual highlighter, right? Like I have my little one here because I do this. Because Alice and Bill were cousins. Alice and Bill were cousins and they bought a house. So I go through. I didn't actually stay in here that they were cousins anywhere. So I haven't used that fact. It turns out to be not that important and like in a perfect answer, but I would use it. But I'm like, the only thing that that really matters for is saying that, um, that it's not a tenancy by the entirety to saying that it's, uh, that it's a joint tenancy. But maybe in a very perfect answer, I might point that out. But I'm like, oh, I never actually used the fact that they were cousins. Even if I had typed it in here, I wouldn't, I know that in my final answer, I didn't use that fact. So it says here, their deed of title provided that they were joint tenants with right of survivorship. I definitely have that fact in here and I definitely um, use that fact. Then here, 10 years ago, and I do have in here 10 years ago, but in my analysis, I'm like, did I use the fact that it was 10 years ago? Not really. So um, you all are going to see this. So when Alice moved to a distant state, she and Bill agreed that he would occupy the house. So do I say this fact? Yes, but I know because I just reviewed and like rewrote out some of this analysis because I do this every time I have a workshop. Um, I know that I didn't actually explain, well, why did they tell us it was 10 years ago? Can anybody think of a reason why they told us it was 10 years ago? And how would you maybe use that fact? So think to yourself, let me give you all like 30 seconds. So I think that you would use that in saying, making an argument that maybe Alice really should be able to get some rent from Bill because he's lived in this house by himself. And, you know, and Alice could have lived there. He could have had to deal with you know, living with his cousin, maybe they don't get along all the time, or he has like some bad habits. Um, and she, you know, and she's lived in a distant state, him not having to worry about her, and he's not paying any rent. It doesn't matter, right? But that's how I, I want to think, like, how could I use that fact? Why did they tell me 10 years ago? And how, so, so one thing, one other little tip here um, is a lot of times people say, oh, okay, well, I, I have this whole sentence in my fact pattern, but you have to use every little fact. And I will often say every little fact. You can often tell if there's a little fact, you look for adjectives, adverbs, look for commas. You know, every time there's a comma, um, you know, here, like you have an offset, you have offset commas. When Alice moved to a distant state, um, she and Bill agreed that he would occupy the house. So whenever there's commas, that tells you that it's a little fact. That's how I always, that's how I break it up. So how would you use that? So I want you to think about that. In the intervening years, Bill paid nothing to Alice for doing so. You could also use the fact that Bill has paid the bills for 10 years. Maybe that's why they called him Bill um, in the fact pattern. There's a little bit of a sense of humor there. Um, right, Bill paid nothing to Alice, right? But he paid all the house-related bills, including cost of repairs and taxes. I'm like, oh, also the fact that it's 10 years ago, Alice hasn't paid the taxes for 10 years. So when I think about, oh, what, um, what can Bill claim against the executor, against Alice's estate? He can claim 10 years of taxes, right? So he's going to get that reimbursed. So I'm like, oh, maybe that's a better use of using that. But now I've thought about that issue because I'm going back through, I've put in all of my facts. Obviously, it's going to take you a little bit of time to type these in. That's where like the 20 minutes really comes in. But we're going back through and we're checking and, and I, you literally use a highlighter. Um, all right, so now I know where I'm going to use the 10 years ago. In the intervening years, Bill paid, in the intervening years, so for these 10 years, Bill paid nothing to Alice for doing so, but he paid all house-related bills, including cost of repairs and taxes. Whenever you see an and, that's also like, they want you to talk about the cost of repairs and the taxes, right? When you see commas, when you see ands, right? Those are different facts you have to explain. So that you always like circle those words, like when you're in the exam, circle the ands to 
so that you don't miss out on that um, fat because it's easy to. And also, this tells me I want to address these separately. That's why, um, that's why I separate out the house repairs and the taxes. So there's the and there because the cost, the rule is different. So that's why they give you the repairs and the taxes because it's a different rule. Just going back, going back to that nightmare of a business association, that corporations essay, going back to that with that essay, right? They gave you that shareholder agreement and had five terms because there are different rules that apply there. So that's a hint to you of, you know, of the various issues that are, that are buried in that sentence or with those facts. All right. So two years ago, without Alice's knowledge or permission, so we want to use that, Bill borrowed $10,000 from lender and gave lender a mortgage on the house as security for the loan. So this is going to be all within that um, severance of the joint tenancy and lien theory versus title theory. All right. Um, and I actually like I know, I'll just tell you guys, I know that in the answer that I wrote, which is a, you know, a passing answer. Um, and I'll tell you, like, how would you get it to a 70 that I want to really explain the significance of like the fact that it's, you know, without Alice's knowledge or permission. So here I, I would use that as a you know potential counter argument. The fact that Alice wasn't aware of the mortgage makes me sort of sympathetic for Alice because, you know, Bill taking out that, you know, Bill getting that mortgage or taking out that loan or giving the um, house a security for the loan, that affects Alice in the future, right? Because if you're in a title theory, that means that if Bill dies first, Alice isn't inheriting his portion. And that seems really unfair. But just because it's unfair, it doesn't change. You know, it's the jurisdiction and you just have to go with the jurisdiction. So, but we want to address that fact. Okay. There is a small apartment in the basement of the house. Um, last year, Bill rented the apartment for $500 per month to tenant for one year under a valid written lease. So tenant for one year under a valid written lease. We do use all of these facts. Tenant paid Bill rent over the next seven months. So paid for seven months during that time. So throughout the seven months, tenant repeatedly complained to Bill about the malfunctioning of the toilet and the drain. So a couple of things here. Again, there's an and here. So the toilet and the drain. So here is something, though, where, um, you know, the, the toilet not working um, and the, the fact that it's the drain that's not working. I don't know. Is, are these two things connected? I mean, it's all part of the plumbing system. But I do want to address it as the toilet and the drain. Uh, and Bill did nothing. So Bill does nothing about anything, right? Bill's not great. Tenant finally, it's funny though, because he does pay all the house related bills, including repairs, but he doesn't pay for these repairs. Tenant finally withheld $500 to cover the cost of plumbers he hired. So you can withhold, right? Remember there is alternatives. So under implied warranty of habitability, um, you know, there's there are various alternatives. So but the plumbers were not able to make the repair and tenant moved out. Oops. So to me, there's a little bit of an issue here because he withheld, right? And then they're not able to fix it. So then he moves out. Usually you can only do one of these. So I want to deal with that. Well, I'm like, well, and like when I was writing this, I was thinking, okay, well, you can only have one of these two options, really. But so that made me pause. I'm like, well, what is, you know, is tenant responsible? Yes or no? So that made me pause and I'm like, oh, so that because it made me pause, that just tells me I need to I need to come up with, you know, a reason why, because I think he should be able to move out. And the and I think the answer here and is that he is not resp responsible for the five hundred dollars because he tried to make reasonable repairs. The plumbers, the experts aren't able to fix it. And it was still a continuing issue. So because the issues continued and Bill had done nothing after seven months of complaints, tenant finally moves out. So I'm dealing, so there is, that's where I had paused. That spot right there where I paused, because I did this when I was doing this, you know, in the last, well, you know, like earlier today, yesterday, uh, when I was going through and just checking through all of this, um, I did pause at this issue. I'm like, well, wait, what do you do here? And, and I thought, you know, tenants should be able to move out. And I was like, oh, it's because it was go, it was an ongoing issue. And then voila, you know, that I'm using those facts. So anytime you, because this is where people lose time, they'll see a fact pattern and they will just get stuck. 
and they'll go back and forth and back and forth. Anytime you go back and forth and you're having a debate about what to do, then that is where you have to, um, that's where you have to uh, decide, okay, I'm going to make a counter argument. I'm just going to do something with this. And it's okay. As long as you deal with the ambiguity and the facts, you deal with the difficulty in the facts, that's, then you're going to be okay. Then you're going to be okay. Okay. Bill sees making payments to lender. Last month, Alice died and her estate is represented by executor. So I have all of my facts and I have all of my facts in here, right? So I've placed all my facts. I'm going to triage. And I'm going to triage my issues. So I look here and the way that you triage is you say, okay, where are my counter arguments? Where is the majority of the facts? Where are they? So I look at this and I, and what issues do I think are a little bit more difficult here? And I do, I literally do this. Like I'll put an asterisk. Uh, I think joint tenancy, it's really easy, really obvious that it's a joint tenancy. The severance of it is actually where there's complexity because it's a majority and a minority. So I want to address that. Um, so I'm, I know that this is where I think that this is a bigger issue is in the severance, but I'm going to get in and out of joint tenancy. I have, and this is where this is the, this is the triaging step, right? In and out here, severance of joint tenancy, spending time here. What claims do they have against each other? This is straightforward, straightforward, straightforward for the repairs, straightforward for the taxes, implied warranty of habitability and covenant of quiet enjoyment. I might want to think about breaking this down a little bit more and talking about the, you know, um, was there a was there a breach? Was there notice? Was there a reasonable time to repair? And then what's the appropriate remedy? There's sort of four questions that we have in here. Covenant of quiet enjoyment. The analysis is basically the same, you know, in regards to whether there was a breach. Well, it's not, it's, it's the same facts, but it, it does vary a little bit. And then was there a constructive eviction? So here, um, I'm going to spend more time. So I don't, the last thing I want you to do is spend all this time going through time, title, interest, possession, and the magic words and do all really beautiful joint tenancy analysis when that's not gonna get you all the points. The points are here in severance and they're in call three. So don't waste a bunch of time or don't go crazy on call two, get in and out of these and say, okay, I'm gonna give myself more time for this. So that's how you triage. You just spend a few minutes looking at where's the density of the facts. What do I do? I also think that there was a complicated issue here because in the applied warranty of habitability with that issue with the tenant moving out and, and the withholding um, the cost of the plumbers. All right, let me come back to this. Let me stop screen sharing. Yes, you do have to, um, you do with, but okay, so, um, oh, ouster. There's no ouster. Uh, there's no ouster because she had permission, they agreed. Um, oh yeah, a lot of you said adverse possession, asking questions, I just saw this. So adverse possession, there's not, there's not an ouster because they agreed to it, it's not hostile. So you could, you could raise that. Oh yeah, that's why you guys are saying that with the years. Okay, that's why I'm going back. Uh, when I'm screen sharing, I can't see the comments, but yeah. So I, so you could talk about that. You could definitely talk about the 10 years, but it wouldn't be there, but that's a great, great, great point. It's a great point. You didn't have to do that and it wasn't addressed in the model answers or the selected answers rather. Um, so there's that. Constructive eviction. So a couple of you are asking about constructive eviction. Constructive eviction is goes hand in hand with um, covenant of quiet enjoyment. If there is a breach of the covenant of quiet enjoyment, you address, does it amount to a constructive eviction? So that's sort of a sub-issue. And in my final answer, I actually do break that out as a sub-issue of covenant of quiet enjoyment. All right. Are you guys feeling okay so far? And I obviously had my facts typed in, so that went a little bit faster. Um, but it's getting through and like thinking about these issues as we go through it and thinking about before we start typing, thinking, where do I need to spend my time? So getting all the facts in there, identifying the issues, one. Um, so identifying what are the issues. Um, that's obviously a huge one. Um, then you know, putting my headings in there, getting the facts, going back, checking and making sure I have all of the facts in there, then saying, okay, where are the points and how am I going to spend my time? So you're thinking through that stuff and that asking how you're going to spend your time is key. Because if you don't do that, then you're going to find out that you're going to run out of time. And I saw that like it happens with every single subject. Um, and in the, I have a book that I'm going to be releasing soon. 
And in that, I actually talk about it. I show various examples, break it down when this happens, you know, and don't break it down in this scenario. So um, my essay book that's going to be coming out in December. Um, all right, the last step. So that's steps one through six. That is steps one through six, right? And then what you do, I don't have to look at the fact pattern anymore. All of my headings are in there already. And then I'm just gonna go through issue by issue. And I am going to type in my rule because notice I hadn't typed in any of my rules yet. I hadn't typed in anything yet. So given that I haven't typed in any of my rules, I obviously need to do that. But if you're running out of time, the thing to omit and the, the thing to do is analysis. The thing to omit is rules. It kills me when I see someone that you know didn't pass an essay. They spotted the issues and they have, they have really beautiful rules, but they didn't do the analysis because they put in the rules before they really started doing the analysis and then they run out of time. And that is a nightmare. And what I want you to do instead, this is why we do it in this way. I don't want you to just put in your headings and put in your rules and you know go that way, you know, proceed that way. I want you to make sure that you have time for the analysis because that is always the most important thing. That's always the most important thing. All right, you all ready for me to show you the last step? All right, good. We, let's go back. All right, so here, and this I've already obviously done it. So joint tenancy, I typed in my rule. And then here you'll see, I just did joint tenancy really, really quickly. I didn't do a separate sentence for time, title, interest, and possession, because I don't have time. I don't have time to do that. I want to get in and out. I just said here, Alice and Bill took title at the same time, have the same title, each have the same interest, both have possession, and the answer was say it's right, it's ridership because, and then this is the fact that I had typed in. Alice and Bill bought a house together. So all I'm doing is saying, adding here, I'm tying in some of the buzzwords from the rule directly above, I write because, and then here are the facts that I already had typed in. Sometimes I will modify the facts to make it a little bit you know, nicer, but even that, like not totally necessary. And then conclusion. And notice I have heading, rule, I have analysis, and I have conclusion. And I always, my analysis is always some form of here, buzzwords, because facts. So here's all the buzzwords, the, the important buzzwords from the rule up here. Severance of joint tenancy. And I'm going to talk through some of the more complicated issues here. So severance of a joint tenancy, a joint tenancy is severed when, you know, here's my rule. Here, Bill may have severed the joint tenancy because two years ago, without Alice's knowledge or permission, Bill borrowed $10,000 from the lender and gave lender a mortgage on the house and security. So thus, depending on whether this is a lien theory or title theory, the joint tenancy may have been severed. So lien theory, majority versus title theory, minority. You don't have to label these, but I did it really here for all of you because, um, you know, it's a little bit easier. So I have my rules here. And this is what I mean. This is why it's a little bit more complicated. So here I say, what happens if we're in the, if we're in the majority, which is a lien theory? Um, so I say, what would happen? Bill would have severed it. If this is a lien theory, then Alice, so what would happen in a lien theory? And then what would each of the interests be? So if this is a lien theory, Alice's interest would have passed the bill. Bill would have a fee simple absolute subject to the mortgage. Executor would get nothing um, at all from the house. So it's really the estate. The executor doesn't get it. But, and then I'm giving the alternative. If this is a title theory jurisdiction, the mortgage would have severed the joint tenancy, making Alice and Bill tenants in common before Alice died. As tenants in common, Alice and Bill each had, uh, should be a comma, each had an undivided one half interest. Upon Alice's death, Bill would retain his undivided interest subject to the mortgage. Additionally, Alice's interest would pass through probate and Alice's one half would pass through her will or testacy if not otherwise accounted for. And then I have my conclusion. So I'm giving these, I'm explaining what happens. And then I give a conclusion. You could also, because a lot of, as a lot of you pointed out, um, ouster. Why is this not an ouster? Oh, my nose is itchy. So you could also have talked about ouster. That also, like the ouster is really good because that also really addresses why it's not an ouster. It's because they agreed that Bill would stay um oh no actually yeah mm 
Actually, would you? I, I don't actually know. You would, you would dress it below. I'm not talking about Esther there. You would have dressed it below. Um, all right, then rent. If you're living in the house alone, I have my rule here for co-tenant rents. I have my analysis. Again, it's pretty straightforward. And then um, answering the call to question. Executor does not have a claim against Bill for rent for his living in the house alone. Tenant. And I here I include the amount because they said it was for seven months. So I say the $3,500. An executor does have a claim against Bill for seventeen fifty for the uh, for half the total rent received, and then the repairs. And I did break them, so the repairs and then the taxes. So those are all very straightforward. So just in and out. You notice how little, you know. I do have my analysis here is thorough, but I'm in and out of these issues for each of them. And then taxes, and then here implied warranty of habitability. So implied warranty. I establish here that there is a breach then notice, and then remedies. So I here I decided to break it down a little bit further as I was in it. Covenant of Quiet Enjoyment. Um, covenant of Quiet Enjoyment, the sub-issue of that, because really for Covenant of Quiet Enjoyment, you breach via total, partial, or constructive eviction, and then constructive eviction. Gave the rule, did the analysis, and the conclusion. All right. In the class, uh, let me go back. And I will stop sharing this. This whole this whole handout, it's a handout that I made for you guys and you'll have it. So we'll post this. Um, we will absolutely post that. Um, all right. So we will post that handout so you can have the answer. I want to go back to, um, and that Noelle just posted. Noelle's like my right hand um, and she posts. Uh, that link to where you can register for our free workshops. That's where the handout will be posted. Give us a couple of days to post this um, so you can check that out. Um, let me go back. Um, let's see. Slides. Let me just do this. Start. Um, so this is a uh, if you like this, we have our Mastering the California Bar Essays course. I know some of you are already signed up for it. And in the course, I go through every single subject. Um, it's It starts next Tuesday um, and I cover, I give you a subject issue checklist for every subject. I go over anal analysis formula. So today I talked a little bit about writing, um, just some simple analysis, but I will also show you how to do counter arguments, how to, you know, uh, what your arguments when you have to draw inferences, when you need to do that in the class, I often have you all, we do it in Zoom instead of on this platform. Um, and so there you can send me a DM and I give you feedback. It's, you know, a pretty interactive. Um, it's pretty interactive. We also have something that we did um, in between the bar exams is we went through and organized all of the other essays um, or all of the essays that I've taught um, in the essay workshop by topic. So you can make sure that, you know, you didn't, you're not just doing comma essays, but you make sure you do free speech, commerce clause, executive power, all of the topics, um, you know, in contracts, you've done, a, you know, some formation essays, some breach essays, you know, all sorts of stuff. So, um, and I talk about, you know, what gets you a 55 for each essay, a 60, 65, how to organize, you know, the various subjects, et cetera. Um, so that starts next week. It's $4.99. You can do it in two payments. Um, and I have a lot of fun with it. Um, and I hope you guys will too. And I teach all of those workshops live. So we do it. They're live on zoom on Tuesdays, not every Tuesday, but there's eight of them. And I do do a session at the end, about 10 days, 12 days before the bar, where I go through every subject and talk about the topics that have not been recently tested, which makes them ripe for testing. And I do give you, um, I do provide, um, fact patterns to practice those from. So I'll hand out like a packet of like 30 essays. So it's a lot of fun. Um, Marcella, yeah. When you see a landlord breaching a lease, I always bring up both. Yeah. And Camila, um, no, you, you don't, uh, for property, it's not one of the California subjects. Um, so you don't have to know what California does, but you just need to know both like the lean theory, title theory, majority, minority, and to get a passing answer. So that's one thing. So to get a 
to get a passing answer, you just have to know the majority. But to get a to, like to go from a 65 to a 70, you'd address both the majority and the minority. So I'd address mean theory and title theory. Um, I also show you like how to self-assess your own writing because even if like I'm I do tutoring with a lot of people for their essays and like you know even then I like I'll meet with somebody once or twice a week and we can go over a few essays in each session depending on what we're working on. Um, but you still have to be really, really good at self-assessing your own work. So, yeah. All right, I wanted to keep it to an hour and a half and we're right at that spot. Um, so I hope to see you all in the class. I hope to see you, you know, in the other classes or I do, I have some more free workshops coming up. Um, I think I have another one on Wednesday for the PT for the July, 2022 exam. So any, you know, anything you all need, you can put it in the chat here or you can put, um, oh, Anna, um, I will have to open up some spots. So we will, we will do that. Um, honest. Yeah. We'll, we'll reach out to you. Um, all right, everybody. Thank you so, so much for coming and I hope to see you all soon and get over this, you know, exam and get on to practicing. <laughs> all right. Thanks everybody. Oh, Michael, that's if you are, um, if you're taking the UBE or if you're taking the California bar. Yes, Lucy, I definitely, definitely teach how to analyze those facts. And we do a lot of practice of that. Yeah, we do a lot of practicing of that as well. All right, everybody have a really lovely evening. I'll see you all soon. Bye.